Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> nice, nice to meet some of you. Nice to see some of you again. Um, yes, I'm Josh. I, I'm going to be talking about um, cave diving the Apple software ecosystem for fun and profit. Uh, um, so first, um, hang on, is this going to work? Hopefully I don't have to click the buttons. Um, oh yeah, yes, about me. Um, for those that don't know me, I used to study at the University of Tasmania. Unfortunately, that stopped as of a month and a half ago when I graduated. Um, and I've been working for Google um, since December. Um, so that was basically straight after I submitted my PhD thesis um, as a site liability engineer. And uh, one other thing that I should probably have put on this slide but didn't um, is that um, I have to apologize to some of you. I, I, I know some of you have given talks already and I would have come to see them except I wanted to I needed to stay within a few meters of a small room with a porcelain bowl in it for health reasons um, over the past couple of days. So I'm, I'm really sorry I missed your, your, your talks. They're probably great and I hope they're recorded because I'm going to look at them. Um, but that also explains why my slides might be a bit patchy. So I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, this comes across as a bit, mis um, bit of a muddle. Um, and so anyway, this, this talk is about um, asking these sorts of questions um, when it comes to Apple stuff. Um, how does blah work? What happens when I do something? Why does, again, blank and uh, what led to blank being like this? So it's this kind of a combination of history and science and science history and um, that's the sort of thing I wanted to talk about when I submitted the proposal. Um, and uh, just in case anyone's, um, yeah, I, on the previous slide I said I worked for Google um, and this is, this is true. Um, I need to briefly mention that I'm not going to be talking about Google. Um, just in case anyone's having a dead dove moment, I won't be angry if you want to go to a different talk. Um, I, I'm, I, I can't really talk about Google today. That's not why I'm here. Um, I love Apple. A lot of other Google engineers love Apple as well. Um, have, have iPhones and iPads and um, a lot of people use Mac workstations at Google. Um, and yeah, so I'm not, I'm not a spokesperson for Google today. You can ask questions about Google. I'm not necessarily going to answer them um, <laughs> or answer them in the way you want me to. Okay, so again about uh, this talk. Just reiterating, this is about peeking into how Apple software works. Um, and there's lots of resources available for doing this. Um, the, the practical application of this uh, will be um, debugging um, your apps and understanding how your, why your apps might have performance problems or be using too much memory. Um, and for me, uh, a lot of the fun of writing this talk was um, doing silly stuff that I just don't normally do especially when I was building apps for myself and for others. Um, and I was going to introduce this really tortured analogy with Minecraft, um, but really this just ended up in me playing several hours of Minecraft. So, <laughs> so um, for me, Minecraft is, okay, partially it's in the game, you know, I go and build stuff, um, you know, make items and go and fight monsters. Um, but there's also a kind of a meta game going on with Minecraft. So they're constantly releasing updates, and in the updates, they give you a list of all the things they added or changed. So in 1.8, like they added iron trapdoors and red sandstone and all sorts of other weird stuff. And so part of the game for me is like, oh, great, they released an update. I'll go in and, and I'll try and make some of these things and find the recipes. And you know, some people go and do that. Um, other people just go and look at the Minecraft wiki, and they find out, oh, yes, OK, so here's where the article on rabbits. Um, why am I talking about Minecraft again? No, this is, this is the other way of playing Minecraft. This is to go into the files and to like, try and decompile. Uh, okay, in this case, I've looked, gone into the objects folder and I found a, this og vorbis file. I think that might be one of the soundtracks. Um, but yeah, try and, try and dig around in the background and try and find um, the resources that make up the game um, just to get a, a hint of what, what, what might be in 1.8.1 or 1.9. Um, and the other reason this is topical is because Microsoft decided to buy Minecraft. There are two responses to this. <laughs> so my analogy sort of comes to this. Like, for people who've been around the software industry long enough, um, 
it's not going to be a surprise to learn, for instance, that macOS and iOS are their BSD Unix, essentially, on the underside. Um, but for people who have only just done app development since 2007, you could completely ignore that and uh, make really successful apps without having any idea that you know, there's, there's a Unix under there. Um, but it did become topical um, lately for another reason, which I'll talk about. So um, first I'm going to talk about debugging the old-fashioned way. Um, this, is, this is with standard, like IDE kind of standard tools that's been available since for decades, really. Um, you can set breakpoints in your uh, Xcode and you can use GDB, which is now LLDB. LL is for um, reference to LLVM, which is the compiler infrastructure. Um, so here are some basic commands. We've got help, um, P and PO. P and PO basically do the same thing these days. There's no um, point in really distinguishing them. Um, and basically what they're useful for is when you've stopped your debugger and you want to print out the value of some variable, um, this is what uh, helps you do that. And uh, if you're busy typing these commands away in Xcode, you might get some stuff like this coming along. Um, this was from uh, one of the default template apps that I just fired up in Xcode. Um, I think it might have been the game iOS Swift, Swift template, or maybe it was the Objective-C one, I can't remember. Um, Usually, usually you don't want to type just P and then some object because sometimes it might not print what you expect. See, in the middle here I've typed P hit results. And it's given me this lovely NS array $2 equals some hex and then uh, zero objects. Um, but really what you want to do is um, you want to ask it for its description. And this is why it's not just um, printing out uh, variables or um, the values of memory these days, it will actually um, execute basic expressions for you. In this case, description is what you want because it gives you a bit more information here. It tells me that the hit results is um, in a failed state for some reason. It's uh, cancel touches and view states, no, that sort of thing's coming along. Uh, so I had planned a demo here. Um, is this the app? Yeah, I'll, I'll run this one. So I've got a breakpoint set here. Um, if you're familiar with breakpoints, you just click somewhere and you can turn them on and off, which is fun. Uh, launches in the simulator. Okay, and this was this breakpoint was in the handle tap, so it'll trigger when I tap the thing. And here's the LLDV window that I talked about. LLDV is also a command, so you can run it in um, terminal. Um, I mentioned help, I think, first. Obviously, that's a bit hard to read. I recommend running the help command in a terminal rather than in that small square there. Um, and notice you don't actually have to press, you have to, don't have to type commands like p and po to get the values of stuff because they're just here. As code just like that, it's very helpful. So if I wanted to find the um, information about that hit results, okay, maybe not. Um, still. Um, there's a bunch of other interesting commands in here. Um, do you, if you uh, stopped um, in the debugger and you want to continue, you can type C. There's also a button for this. So this is the continue button. Uh, they made the icons a little, I don't know, more abstract in the newer Xcode. But this, this is, um, so this continue program execution is the same as typing C in the command. Um, we have N for single step to next line, uh, which is in the current thread. Um, if you are running from the terminal and you want to run a particular binary somewhere in disk, then you can use R command. Q for quit, uh, F, F and T are for navigating around. So what's going on when you're running a program is you're, you know, it's, it's called your main function or whatever, and your main function is called some other function and so on, and you've got this whole stack of um, function calls that it's um, got down to. You can use F to go between the, the function calls. So if you're like busy debugging one that's really low, um, like it's, it's like you're, you're tight in a loop and you want to um, go out into the previous one which is called some function which is in a tight loop. And you can use F to go around. And uh, T also for going between threads when you've got a multi-threaded app. Um, there's a few other funny th um, commands though and uh, one that I found in Xcode while I was well, I typed help and it said GUI and it said switch into the cursor space GUI mode well, okay, what does this do? Well, when I tried it on my um, home machine, 
Um, this is what I got. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, no, it, it's fine. I mean, it's a debugging tool. Like, if I, I wonder if it'll actually do it here. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, the GUI mode actually only makes sense in a terminal. And, yeah. um, so don't, don't uh, well, I mean, if you care about your Xcode project, then maybe, yeah. But that said, the, the GUI mode in um, L, uh, terminal, um, when, you, when you run LDB from terminal, it's actually reasonably useful. Um, so if, if you're sort of low-level hacking around with a ter uh, text editor and you want to LDB something, then I, I recommend that. Um, oh, some tips for Xcode breakpoints. So I showed that just clicking on the gutter will create and um, disable um, and re-enable breakpoints for you. If you want to temporarily disable all of them and then reactivate all of them, um, you can use Command Y. Another useful one is like me. I accidentally click in the gutter all the time, and then there's this ugly breakpoint arrow there that I didn't want. So I'm like, ah. Oh. So the um, the shortcut to remove it would be um, command backslash. Um, it's not to be confused with command forward slash, which will comment the line. So if I go, hang on. If I go to Xcode again, fortunately it crashed. So I have to open it. So here um, I've got some breakpoints. Let's, leave, let's turn some of them off and add some more. So for Command Y, they all go gray. So breakpoints, no more breakpoints um, the next time I run this. And if I want to turn them back on the same state that I had them, just Command Y again. So these, these uh, commands are also available from the debug menu. Um, break, deactivate breakpoints, Command Y. Um, and the other one that I mentioned was how to like, kill a breakpoint once you don't want it anymore. Just go Command backslash. And boom, there's this magic. It's gone. <laughs> um, command forward slash to comment the, the line. All right. Um, another tip that you might be wondering, having seen the previous slide, is that this symbol is called the place of interest sign if you want to find it in character view it. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about instruments. Uh, instruments is a really powerful um, application for tuning the performance in your apps um, and finding out where the bottlenecks really are. Um, and what it, it functions like a, well, the first time I saw a window like this, I thought, hang on, this looks like uh, Logic Pro or GarageBand. It's, it's kind of a multi-track recorder. And that's exactly what it does. It basically records parameters um, and performance of your app um, over time um, with multiple different instruments. So there's, there's kind of a musical analogy going on here. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a screen cap of Logic Pro next to it in case you've never seen it. So yeah, uh, vaguely similar. Um, and some things that are worth explaining um, how they function is um, the common way of doing uh, performance analysis of an app is to use CPU sampling. And the basic idea is this, that Every fraction of a second, say every hundredth of a second, um, a timer will fire in the system, and it'll what it'll cause it'll cause your app to just freeze for a moment, and then instruments will come along and take a snapshot of um, wherever it's executing in all its threads, and the more samples appear in a particular function, then that function is responsible for more of the time. Um, so this is kind of statistics um, being used to analyze your code. Um, and that's, that, to be honest, that's useful for finding like 90% of the performance bottlenecks in um, a, a common app, something that's not too, say, I.O. or graphics intensive. Um, another um, very useful thing is um, the allocations instruments. And uh, this is implemented a lot simpler. Um, the basic idea is you, um, well, if you're the system, for instance, you, you own the malloc function, right? So what you can do is every time someone calls malloc, um, you record the size and um, like what call made it the how how the program got to call malloc, and then um, you can you can do a simple analysis of saying okay what functions allocated what sort of chunks of memory. Uh, so some uh, demo of this I guess. Um, 
I'll take out these breakpoints for now. Oh, I could have used Command Y. Um, to access the instruments, you go to the Xcode menu, uh, Open Developer Tool and Instruments. Or if you're like me, you have it on the dock already. Um, another way of accessing um, instruments, I think you can go... N never mind. You know what? I'm just going to go in here. So I'm going to get rid of that one. You can create a new um, profiling template for... Instruments is really powerful. They can actually pro um, profile all of the processes running on the system. Some things you... One thing you have to keep in mind with this is that some apps will disable the functionality required for instruments. Um, these are kind of Apple vaguely sensitive apps like iTunes and Front Row and you'll see a warning at the start of the instruments user guide about this. Um, normally you want to pick a specific process to profile and um, It'll give you a list of the running ones and it'll let you pick one. So uh, what I'm just going to do though is I'm going to pick Xcode itself. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, and I'm going to choose the Time Profiler. So I hit record and the functionality that Instruments uses is called Dtrace, which I'm going to talk about soon. Dtrace is kind of kernel level um, profiling and, and system um, analysis code. So it's got to require my um, root password. I hope you didn't see what that was that I typed in. <laughs> okay, so it's recording now, and uh, we can see how long it's spent recording. Oh, so a whole like 30 seconds already. I'm going to stop that. And over that time, sometimes it just takes a while to analyze what it's got. Um, in this case, I think it's, no, it's not, okay, there's a little spike there. Um, if you want to zoom in on um, samples that were taken over a small duration, you just drag across the time line there. In this case, um, Xcode was kind of in the background, right? So it wasn't really doing anything. Um, and if we want to see what it did, well, it was in the main thread, it was in NS application run, it was doing not a lot. Right. And it also has a dispatch thread coming along here, some timers, yeah. But um, actually, you don't have to go to instruments to get basic CPU information if you want. What you can do, and this is something that um, they appear to have added in iOS, um, in Xcode 6 rather. So well, after you're... Um, app is running. Uh, yes, I do. <clears throat> After your app is running, so that's a reasonably intensive app, um, you've got this stuff here. Um, so I can just open up the CPU tab and it's got this lovely, these graphs coming up of, we've got uh, CPU percentage. You might as be worried that this is using 99% of my CPU. That's not quite true. It's using 99% of one CPU core um, because the graph the chart here goes up to 400%, and that's how many cores are in this MacBook Air, apparently. Uh, we've also got um, the, a comparison of the CPU used by this process versus other processes on the system currently. Um, something, some other things are chewing up about 60% of the CPU, and then the rest is free. And we've got a similar sort of breakdown happening over time and by thread. So this app, this template app that I just opened uh, up yesterday, appears to be mostly... Um, bound to one thread. Um, we see that one thread is using 99% of the CPU and the rest of the threads that it's got open aren't doing very much. Um, we can also look at the memory. It's directly from Xcode as well. Um, and we see here it's pretty stable at 64 meg. That's pretty, that's all right. And, and disk IO. This is all really shiny. I, I didn't actually realize they were, these were here until the other day, so that's why I had to talk about them now. But if you want to do this sort of thing um, back in instruments, well, it's really simple. So we've got the time profile here. Well, what other instruments can we add? Well, if you go to the library, which is accessible from the window menu, you see there's all sorts of instruments here. I suppose we want to correlate the, uh, the time profiler with uh, allocations. Let's drag allocations on. And we also want to look for, uh, I don't know, let's search for um, graphics. Okay, um, let's try the GPU driver. 
and let's change it to the simulator. You notice that um, Instruments is smart enough to know that the, even though the simulator is running a process which is essentially the same, a process in the same environment as the operating system that Instruments is in, um, it will separate out the simulator um, apps for you. So here we've got uh, the app that I've been running. And now if I hit record, it fires back up the app. And it's kind of laggy, which is fun. And I hit stop on that. So um, we see a bit of correlation here um, between allocations and time, um, CPU time. It uh, gets to, it, after the sort of um, jumpy part at the start where it's, the, the animation was chugging, it gets to this sort of plateau where the animation was smooth. And then down on GPU driver, we actually got nothing because there's multiple GPU drivers. Um, just find the one that works. Playing around with instruments is fun. Um, I mentioned earlier that Instruments is based on Dtrace. And what Dtrace is, is actually a thing crea initially created by Sun Microsystems um, for SunOS in 2003, was when it was first available. And then they formally released it under the CDDL for um, public consumption, I guess, in 2005. It wasn't long after that that Apple added it to Mac OS X. And what Dtrace is, is essentially the collections component of um, instruments. It's the part that goes and understands the system and gets the deep knowledge for you. So if you want to play with Dtrace, um, I recommend this website, this Dtrace Toolkit. Um, and it turns out that a lot of the Dtrace Toolkit scripts are already on your system. And to show you what I mean, well, I'm just going to open up a terminal and I'm just going to blow that up. So if we want to find what um, dtrace tools are on the system, just man-k dtrace. <coughs> Here we have a bunch of stuff. This looks kind of like the uh, list of instruments from instruments. It's not a coincidence. <coughs> and these are all scripts. Um, they end with .d, which is kind of confusing to a guy who's familiar with Linux like me, because .d usually means like a config directory of some kind. But in this case, the .d just means it's a dtrace script. So maybe we want to find out what some of these things do. Um, let's just try, uh, let's sudo, um, what's one I was using before? CPU, CPU walk, measure which CPUs the process runs on. Okay, CPU walk .d. I asked for my password because dtrace requires root privileges. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, so as soon as it says sampling, um, it's recording stuff from my system, um, and it says hit Control C to end. So I hit Control C, and it immediately um, boots out a um, list of hmm, process distribution graphs. You can say kext cache looks like it uh, used a bunch of CPU cores. Oh, it's kind of ignored number one for some reason. Yeah. Um, now, I'm sure these things are scripts. So what we can do is we can see if I can find it. Um, So this is, looks kind of like a shell script, actually. It starts off with a shebang line saying, user has been dtrace-s for running this as a script. It gives us um, some information about how to use it. So it, it, it tells us how it's uh, licensed. And then we've got this slightly strange looking um, language here. But it's pretty easy to see what it's doing. So there's dtrace triple colon begin, which is what it'll do when it starts up. Here, we see it was printing the message that we saw. Um, the profile, triple colon, and then 1,000 hertz. So that's saying this is going to take a sample every uh, 1,000 for the second in this case. Um, I don't know what the bit in the middle means. And uh, then every second is also going to count um, this counter. So basically what that's implemented for is um, if you pass an argument to this script, 
you can say, I want to sample for how, some number of seconds. And that's where the, the dollar one is comes in. So if you pass in an argument, the dollar one will have value, so it'll print just sampling, otherwise it'll print the hit control C to end part as well. And at the end, it'll print um, an analysis of all the stuff at the end. So, okay, D-trace scripts are pretty simple, um, and they're some very sophisticated ones that are hundreds of lines long, but um, a lot of the really useful ones are only a few lines long like that one. Um, some other, oh, oh yeah. Um, I was not sure where to put this slide, but I was definitely um, confident that everyone should be at least aware of this tech note. Even though it was published in 2011, um, there's bits of it that are still quite relevant. Um, and I'm, uh, there's a few, uh, a few nuggets that I got from this um, were the malloc debugging, which um, you can use either in Xcode or from the, the terminal. There's a thing called, these are, these are environments, variables that you set. So you, I'll show you how to use them in a sec. But basically, um, if you set malloc scribble, what you get is instead of just getting uh, an uninitialized um, memory area when you call malloc, what it will do is it'll fill it with a known value. And then when you, de uh, when you free it, it'll um, fill it with a different value. So you can see what, you, you get an idea of what uh, memory might have been allocated and deallocated. Um, guard edges um, puts extra memory either side of the malloc. And this is for um, protecting you against, um, yeah, overflow, being out of bounds, basically. And um, we also have this um, malloc stack logging, which is very interesting, which is, uh, okay, it records the traces for each um, memory, memory block that you allocate. It's smart in that it will, um, if you immediately allocate and then deallocate something, um, it'll just remove those from the log because you're probably not interested in those. If you're using malloc stack logging, you're probably interested in memory leakage and um, you're more interested in the, the long running uh, memory usage of your app. So just to show you what these do, um, I've got this, I've got this um, piece of C that I wrote which just um, allocates, I don't know if you can read that. All it, uh, this first function just um, prints um, 64 um, hex values from a, a buffer. And um, in the main, I've just, uh, I um, malloc a buffer of 64 bytes, I print it out, and then I free it, and then I print it again. So if I say malloc scribble, export malloc scribble equals I mean, one, I guess. If I run, no, when I put it, malloc fun. Okay, first of all, immediately after I um, ran the command, it says malloc enabling scribbling to detect mods to free blocks. And here's the value it filled that memory area with, AA. And there's the um, value it filled the memory with after I freed it, which was 5.5. Five. And if I, if I unset that, and then rerun the um, app, it's filled, with <coughs> it's filled with zeros, which I think is just an accident in this case. But you know, in real world, you <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not going to bother. Like, you can. It, it may be just the case that it had an initialized memory block in the memory, in the, in the executable, and decided to allocate the page there. So, um, so how do you use these in Xcode? Well, to use environment variables in Xcode, what you do is you go edit scheme, and then the arguments tab, there's a space for specifying environment variables. But it turns out that when Apple use, like, suggests that you use a particular way of debugging your apps, um, they go and build in a way of activating it um, eventually, at least, um, in Xcode. So in this case, um, the, malloc, um, the, the malloc debugging stuff is available from the diagnostics tab of the schemes. So you can just tick on and off, scribble, um, guard edges, and also this interesting thing here called zombie objects. Um, there's a few other things here. So I'll just talk a little bit about zombies. Very, very beautiful zombie. Um, so the idea with zombies is, in Objective-C, um, at least in the old days before Arc, you could, you could over-release an object. And or after you've released an object, right, um, it, could, it gets freed. Uh, after everything's released, it's, it's, it's declared that it's no longer using the object. So um, at that point, um, dialog gets sent to the object, and it disappears. 
But what happens is if you try and send a message to your delocated object, weird things happen. It might just crash. It might, um, it might run the code that was there before. Um, you don't actually really know. Um, so the idea with NSOB is, is it will, when your uh, Objective-C objects get deallocated, it'll swap it out, for instance, of this NSZombie class. And NSZombie records when it gets messages. So that helps you debug um, more memory issues as well. Zombies, I think, is also an option in instruments as well. Um, yeah. I was going to talk about the life of an Objective-C message, but this is, this is getting to the um, sort of confusing trivia part of the talk. Um, basically, Objective-C messages, a lot of people sort of wonder why um, sending messages to Objective-C objects, which is, you know, calling methods on it, right? Um, people say it's slower. And it's kind of worth explaining why this is the case. Um, it, what it is, 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 is it's slower compared to a C function call. Um, in a C function call, what you do is you push all the arguments to the function you're calling on the stack, or what have you. Uh, put them in the right registers, say. And then you just jump to the memory location where the function is residing. In Objective-C, it's a bit more complicated. I thought I'd maybe try and explain with uh, assembly language, but this doesn't really make any sense, even to me. Um, that's not true. I could probably just decrypt some of this. Um, down the, the last three lines, um, we have basically calling this function called obj-c message send. So this is, this is what um, a, a, a message send in, in Objective-C gets compiled to. This is actual code that I ripped out this morning. Um, so so the, the last three instructions there are calling message send, and the first four are more or less preparing what messages it's going to send. Um, me sending a message is this, this function obj-c message send. Um, it's got id self, which I thought was very Freudian. Um, and when it comes to actually compiling this, um, we have, you know, we're sending a message, some message with a parameter to an object foo, which is just a pointer in memory, and returning some other pointer to a value called x, um, um, assigning to x. So this, this gets more or less translated to a call to this message send function. And um, the selector uh, parameter, which is the message we're um, sending, well, that has to get translated as well, because uh, essentially in, in code, that's, the selectors have to get rid <laughs> The compiler does this for you. This is, this is sort of the appreciating how much length Apple has gone to make your life nice. Um, they register the string for this selector for you at the start, and then they pass that uh, pointer to that selector in um, every time you call the function. It, it just swaps it out. OK, so that was um, juicy trivia. No, uh, that was uh, obscure trivia number one. Obscure trivia number two is um, I kind of mentioned a lot about Unix and BSD in my abstract, so I thought I'd better talk about that. It is uh, OS X and iOS are Unixes. Um, OS X in particular is an open group certified Unix. You can go to this website and you can see that they are indeed certified. Um, and many users were a bit surprised that um, OS X is a Unix because in particular, it's a Unix that runs Bash shell, and Bash shell has had a recent uh, vulnerability, but it's not Apple's problem. It's actually really smart of them to use um, these existing technologies, if you ask me, because there's, there's no po you've got to pick your battles, right? Um, if you're going to make a new operating system, um, you might as well use, you might as well at least take ideas from stuff that's out there. And that's, that is what Apple did, um, sort of. The, the real history, okay, so, um, but before they got to the bash, they actually ran TC shell, which was um, on 10.0 on to 10.2.8, which is more meaningless trivia for you now. Um, I have this slide getting here. Okay, Apple open source. Yeah, I, I take a, I've taken the rest of this talk more or less from this site. You can go to and you can browse Apple's open source. There's a lot of stuff that is open source. Um, and this includes the, um, source to Darwin and the kernel and device drivers and a whole heap of random things. The history of OS X is kind of like, sort of works like this. So they, OS X is based on Darwin. Darwin feeds into OS X. They're kind of more or less the same thing because they're both Apple. The, the logo of Darwin is Hexley the platypus, which is seen wearing a little demon hat, which is a reference to the BSD demon. Um, 
Darwin is Darwin and OS X are the successor to Next Step, which is the operating system made by Next, which is the company that Steve Jobs founded after he was kicked out of Apple. <laughs> what? Kicked, Steve Jobs was kicked out of Apple? I thought he died. No, no, no. But back in the 80s, before. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a funny thing. Um, so. <laughs> After the Macintosh, right? The Macintosh. If you've seen Jobs the movie, it's a little bit like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not entirely true, um, but yeah. No, after after the Macintosh project, um, basi Steve basically left because of John Scully, and he went, went and started Next, and they made various um, ominous big black cube computers, um, but they turned out to be very useful because. Um, Tim Berners-Lee from CERN used his next cube to make the first web browser, essentially. So, you know, good things came of that. Uh, another, other good things that came of that were Darwin, um, which is the successor to Next. Um, they also used Objective-C. And um, I, I thought I'd mention this now. Um, like, if you're thinking of poking around in the Mac OS kernel, there's a big section at the start of the kernel programming guide that says, keep out. And they mean it. There, you should not code in the kernel if you have if you can avoid it. The only reasons you should be coding in the kernel are if you're writing device drivers or you're doing something really insane. Um, so to tell you a bit about the Mac OS kernel, you have to sort of start the story with the next kernel. The next kernel is called XNU, which stands for X is not Unix. <laughs> and uh, what they basically did was they took the Mark 2.5 micro kernel that um, CMU had developed and they mushed in a front end um, that implemented, it was basically the 4.3 BSD front end to it. So you could talk to the Monk kernel via this um, BSD interface. And um, they invented this thing called DriverKit, which was quite nice. It was a driver interface which was entirely in Objective-C. So just kind of imagine writing dri uh, device drivers in Objective-C. It's completely opposite what um, the m most people write device drivers these days, which is in C or C++. And that is actually what they moved to for IOKit. Um, OS X XNU is just the successor. When Apple, re when Apple purchased Next and reacquired Steve, um, they upgraded the Mark component to 3.0 and they changed the 4.3 BSD components to FreeBSD. This is mostly meaningless to app developers, but it's kind of interesting history for me. But this is not the first Apple Unix. Because after Steve founded Next, um, they saw Apple looked back at Next and thought, oh, Next are going after the workstation market. And we should probably have a product in that area. So they um, got together a couple of developers and they ported a System 5 Unix to um, the Macintosh. And this is called Apple Unix. And this is, uh, it ran on a limited number of old world Macs. Um, here's just a few of the one models that it ran on. So the graph kind of looks like this. Um, up the top is the diagram I had before. Um, way off um, on the left, we have the beginning of time, which is research Unix by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, um, which is and System 5 in the middle, and then Apple Unix, which was from the late 80s to the mid 90s. The last release was in 1995. Uh, Apple Unix looks like this for in, um, interest's sake. You might think, wait, hang on, isn't that just System 7? Yes, it is System 7, um, but you can also get a terminal in it. This is what it looks like when it's starting up. And um, just to prove that it is a Unix, um, the Macintosh hard drive is not called Macintosh HD. It's called forward slash, which is root. And you see a bunch of Unixy files coming along here. <laughs> you might be asking, wait, hang on, he's going to give a demo of this? Yes. <laughs> in April this year, some guys got together, uh, well, actually one guy, uh, and made a... Um, Macintosh 2 emulator, which is specifically designed to run Apple Unix, called Shoebill. And so if we hit run, yep, OK, so there's Apple Unix. It's starting up. <laughs> uh, yep, OK, it's decided that, uh, OK, you can't, you can't initialize the video device. Weird, OK. It was working before. Um, you might be asking, OK, why don't I just run this on um, Basilisk 2 or something. The reason you need a special emulator for Apple Unix is Apple Unix depends on um, adequately simulating the memory management chip. Which, and to understand why that chip isn't implemented in um, other Ma old Mac emulators. 
you have to realize that the way they implement old, other old Mac em em emulators is basically take the Mac OS ROM and use that as an interface rather than emulating the whole CPU and all the chips inside the, the box. So that's Shoebill. You can get, there's a GitHub repository for Shoebill. It's really quite fun. Um, so Apple Unix isn't Darwin. Um, Apple Unix is basically dead, um, but it's uh, fun for history's sake to play around with it. Um, and other than Apple and the fact that they implement a few POSIX standards, there's no real relationship. Um, here's what Darwin looks like. Yeah, that looks like a terminal as well. Um, you can open the terminal from terminal app, but there's another way of actually accessing the terminal, um, and you get one that sort of looks like this particular font on this particular kind of black, um, and you type uh, greater than sign console if you've got a login prompt. Um, Darwin is an open source project. It includes the kernel. It includes the kernel. It includes a bunch of device drivers. A um, bunch of BSD commands and so on. Uh, it doesn't include the Apple proprietary stuff. It's just not all that surprising. Um, it does include the user interface, Finder, Doc, um, all sorts of apps. There is one app it does include, though. Does anyone tell me what app is included in Darwin? Anyone? No? I'll show you. So here I've got Darwin in a VM. I'm just going to fire that up. Um, you can download an ISO of Darwin and install it on an x86 machine if you've got one handy. Um, here I've just installed it. So, yeah, a bunch of terminal output. Oh, that's not very handy. Okay, so it's shrunk the screen good. Cool. So I've logged into Darwin, and unfortunately the text is kind of small there, but if I Change into the applications directory. I see there's one app in there. It's chess.app. Chess is open source. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't give you a, a um, graphical environment to run chess.app, but it includes it anyway. So uh, we've, we've, we've dug down into, OK, so that was Darwin. I've described the XNU kernel. Um, and inside XNU is this thing called Mark. Mark is responsible for this thing called ports. The idea of Mark was um, Unix was kind of getting a bit complicated in the kernel. They had um, a bunch of stuff which was directly implemented and um, not well abstracted. So Mark, the, the goal of Mark from Carnegie Mellon University was to implement this thing called ports and messages. It was going to be this interprocess communication thing and it would allow them to separate out um, device drivers from the kernel and user processes from device drivers in the kernel and all this other lovely stuff. Um, but the, the quick overview is this. Like, uh, a lot of old operating systems and a few current ones like Linux use a monolithic kernel. The basic idea is you have the device drivers sitting in the same memory space as the kernel. Um, it's a bit fast and unsafe, and um, it becomes hard to port if you do this wrong. Um, it, has the, it has the opportunity to become real spaghetti code really quickly. Uh, the idea of a microkernel, which is what Mark 3.0 became in the end, was that you separate out the device drivers into their own processes. And then you communicate with these processes via the IPC mechanism, which in this case is messages and ports. Um, it's simple and it's modular, but unfortunately, switching between kernel, pro um, kernel address space and um, other processes spaces in both, it gets a there's a penalty involved. Um, so some people decided this is a bit slow. Um, the XNU kernel, kernel under Mac OS X is a hybrid. Um, the only other, the, the other widely used hybrid kernel with a vaguely similar design is actually Windows. So here we have the XNU kernel. The basic idea is you keep the IPC mechanism. You keep the ports and the messages. But what you do is you leave the device drivers running in the kernel's address space. And this is, the ultimate, this is ultimately the reason why there's a big keep out message in the kernel programmer's guide is because when you're in kernel space, you can screw up the kernel's memory and you can crash the system really fast. Uh, I was going to talk about. Um, as a compar way of comparing the Objective-C messages to how you invoke um, functions in the kernel. Here's an example of a far simpler example. Um, we're just calling a sim simple kernel function. Here are the important parts. Um, we've got, we put the um, syscall we want to make into EAX, and then we call syscall. Syscall 
Um, so here's, here's the number of the thing we want to call, it's method trap, and uh, syscall enters the privilege mode of the CPU. This is the way the kernel in, um, enforces um, being able to control the hardware and stopping your process controlling the hardware, is that it has access to all the CPU instructions and your process doesn't. So that's how that works. Um, I was going to talk about timers. That's sort of running out of time, though. Um, but there's an uh, interesting thing I found while browsing open source is that um, it just, the way it decides how to do timer coalescing, the idea with a timer is you want a, your process to wake up at some point in the future. So what you do is you tell the kernel, OK, wake me up at this time. But if you're waiting for 10 seconds, or if you're waiting for a second, or if you're waiting for half a second, you actually probably most of the time don't care to get exactly half a second, or a second, or 10 seconds, or 10 years, or whatever you requested. So the idea with timer coalescing is you introduce a bit of slop into the, the time so that the timers line up. And once all the timers line up, the CPU can just wake up once and run all the timers and then go back to sleep. And this is how it saves, this is how it saves power. Um, the function that actually computes the slop is called timer call slop in etimer.c. And I can't remember exactly where that was located. Um, but if you have a look at that function, what it does is it takes the value you give it, and if it decides your process isn't critical, it will add up to 12.5% of the um, time difference or a millisecond. So the the smaller of those two numbers, it'll, it'll add to the timer in order to make the timers line up. And that's how timer coalescing works in, in Darwin. Uh, I don't know why I included this slide. Sorry, this is, this is getting to the hairy part. Uh, I was going to talk about compilation. Uh, turns out there's a code rewriter in LLVM. Um, and yes, there is a file called rewrite of C. It's just got a comment called hacks and fun related to the code rewriter. Um, and if you're wondering why I was digging around in here, well, I wanted to find out how blocks worked. This particular file has some of the juicy details. Um, in particular, it includes this piece of code, which is the block implementation. It doesn't include this code directly. Obviously, that's a bit silly. It includes this code in a string that it embeds in your Objective-C code when it's compiling it. Right? <laughs> so in this case, we've got a block implementation struct. It's got some pointer at the start, some flags, another thing, and then a func pointer. So the func pointer in this case is the function it's going to call when you invoke the block. But the thing at the top is very interesting. It's void pointed to isa, and the word isa should be familiar to some people who are familiar with Objective-C programming from a, a while back, is that this is basically the memory layout of an Objective-C object, which means you can call, you can send messages to it. Don't do this if you're shipping um, the code to Apple, though I think this is a private API. <laughs> it counts as a private API anyway. But you can say, define some block somewhere, and then later on you can send it and invoke messages, though you're calling it as an Objective-C object, which is nice. Uh, about Swift, um, I just wanted to point out that there is definitely more than one kind of Swift. Uh, last night at the quiz, we discovered there was another kind of Swift, um, which was some kind of supercomputing language. Um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So there's Apple Swift programming language. There's the species of Parrot, which you should be worried about. There's also a system on chip microarchitecture. This made things very confusing in Apple land because in 2011, no, 2012, Swift was used as a code name for the Apple A6 chip. <laughs> so when you're searching for Swift on the Apple's open, open source website, you'll probably see a lot of references to the Swift microarchitecture and see a lot of ARM um, disassembly that won't make any sense to you. But that's what that's about. I was going to do some call Foundation spunking time, um, but I think I'm more or less out of time, and it's nearly lunchtime. So I'll take questions. Yes. I'll try. Yeah. This, yeah. See, this is the problem. Is yeah, it's hard to just impart lots of experience in 50 minutes. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll try and put these slides up um, at some point and tweet about them for a start. Um, there'll, there'll be this, this talk was re being recorded, so that's um, another thing. Um, I guess, I guess the, if you want to dig around, um, Apple's open source website's really basic. It, it, will, it will dump out source code for you, um, and it will give you a, 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 li a directory listing of the files on it, basically. Um, but not much more than that. Like, it, it'll do syntax highlighting, and that's about it. Um, I guess, I guess if you want to learn more about how operating systems work, a good start might be how 
There's, there's a good book about how FreeBSD works by a guy called Kirk McCusick um, and others. Um, he's, he's a very good writer. Um, yeah. There was actually, I think I've got some spare slides in here. <laughs> yes. Okay. OS 10 kernel programming, okay. Hang on. So uh, OS 10. GH, OS 10 internals. Like OS internals, the book? OS 10 book, okay. I'm it seeing. Okay, yeah, well, that would be a very good place to start as well. Mm, yeah. Um, so there was one thing I did kind of vaguely hint at in my um, abstract. What happens if you delete the syswap file on a running system? Well, if you do it with RM, not much, because it just deletes the directory entry, and the kernel still has a descriptor to it, so it's like, well, you haven't stopped the kernel running. <laughs> and the space isn't freed because the kernel still owns the space. And the virtual memory system keeps going, so nothing happens. And then when you reboot the system, it just comes back. So given that's the theory, let's try it. <laughs> Get rid of that. I'm not actually going to do it on my laptop. <laughs> Well, I am going to do it on my laptop. It's just going to be in a VM on my laptop. So yesterday I installed Mac OS 10.9 in, in VMware. It's, and I um, went and found the, the virtual memory file. So if you want to know where this is on your system, respond, damn it. Maybe it's preemptively crashed. No, not today. I oh, know. Hang on. What's going on? I'm going to new window. Hello. Why is that? It's not typing. That is bizarre. Bluetooth not available. Hang on. That's bizarre. That's absolutely bizarre. Okay. Well, there goes that plan. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we've got swap file zero, swap file one. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do this. I tried it before it works, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it while I'm presenting and screen recording. <laughs> okay, do we have any other questions? It's not coffee time, it's lie, it's lunchtime. Go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs>